Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, if I can just get a thumbs up from someone if my audio sounds okay. I am trying out a new computer. It works great. Perfect. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome. We're officially going to get started in about three minutes. In the meantime, if you would head down to successes and celebrations and tell us what's going on uh, in your lives and what are you celebrating?
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mather Days. Uh, my name is Teresa Wills. I'm an assistant professor at George Mason University, and I'm in the Mathematics Education Leadership Program, meaning that this is the way that I normally teach. I have been teaching synchronous online uh, classes for the past six years using interactive slides, and that translates into opportunities to work with kindergartners, first graders, third graders, fifth graders, and middle schoolers. So um, I have a lot of experience with different ages, and I hope I can share some tips with you today. We're going to be working within Google Slides, and I'm going to post those in the chat box. If you don't already have them open, you're going to want to open them in addition to um, Blackboard Collaborate. And on slide one, uh, there are several um, pieces of information, including my email address, website, Twitter, and YouTube. And also, if you implement any of these math tasks um, in the next couple weeks, if you could um, put them up on Twitter with the hashtag MatherDays so that other people can connect to them. On site two is the math specialist program that uh, I am in at George Mason. Um, I teach a lot of different uh, math methods classes in much the same way you're going to experience today. So if you're interested in becoming a math specialist, check out our program. Slide three is just a heads up that you can find all recordings and templates on my website. And then slide four and five are where we are sharing our successes and our celebrations. If you haven't done so already, find a space on four or five and tell us what's going on in your lives that you're celebrating. So Jessica, tell us about a toddler riding a tricycle. I bet you have all new challenges in front of you. How's it going? well she's uh she's enjoying it and thank goodness she can't pat pedal faster than i can run so <laughs> <laughs> yeah you would have your work cut out for you if that was the case yep someone received a rocket award can you tell us a little bit about that award Hi, so um, I'm a first year teacher um, at Riverside Elementary School, and so our our mascot is the rocket. So each month we pass around kind of, a, it's a little award that kind of looks like the Washington Monument. Um, and we just recognize other teachers, you know, that are um, showing like term determination, um, effort, attitude, you know, the different qualities that we believe um, at our at our school. We just, we just recognize one another. I mean, so we, we nominate teachers who are, um, showing those areas each month. Awesome, Stephanie. I'm so excited to hear that you're having so much success in your uh, first year. Um, awesome. Laura, tell us a little bit about, you said you're able to watch ESAW level one and two gain voice in the virtual classroom. I know there's plenty of people who are interested in networking with you just on that comment. Tell us how it's going. Um, hi, so I teach, I'm Laura, I teach fourth grade um, in Fairfax County at a Title I school where the majority of our students are ESOL um, students who are learning English as a second language, and I have um, a, a large group of my kids are level one, twos are threes, um, so they are very new to our program, and they're very, um, their English skills are something that we're working on, and it's just amazing when we give them spaces in our online classroom to see their voices come out where they wouldn't maybe share it when we're in the physical classroom, uh, maybe just shy or fear, or anxiety of speaking English out loud, but then just watching their sentences online is just really illuminating. Wonderful. I always like to see your slides online, and I, I see the one here. Lots of um, space for students to write and type. That's amazing. Let's see, someone said that they were helping a kindergarten teacher with Google Slides. Again, I know you're um, going to want to share that information with our group today. Lots of kinder teachers are trying to figure out how we get our youngest students who are still working on um, literacy and dexterity to be online. So how did you do it? Hi, it's Wendy. Um, I had a teacher who was videoing most of her lessons. Um, so we were able to like try some Google Slides together and see like what it would look like for kinder 
on a laptop and an iPad, so that helped with her comfort zone. And one thing that she, we started with like number identification, um, which is more of my mathy background, but she was really thinking about letter identification. So we um, made some snagged images of letters and helped her to think about like if it was on a cookie sheet in the classroom, how we could make that, those virtual letter manipulatives come to life on Google Slides. So it was, it was exciting and hopefully she'll start to use it. Oh, that's very cool. I can't wait to see what that looks like. I know you're always posting uh, your exciting things also. All right, folks, so this is Successes and Celebrations. It is a great way for us as a community to network together. Um, if, um, if any of you all had heard something from somebody else that you're interested in learning more, you can use the chat box to either privately chat or publicly chat about, hey, what's your email address? I want to get in touch with you. But even more so for children, it gives them a chance to um, have these community building spaces that we don't always get online. Um, and so it can turn that feeling of isolation into this warmth feeling of I have friends and I have people that are similar to me online. Alrighty, I'm going to move down to slide six and jump right into our math routine. Um, this math routine is from the book, Teach Like Your Hair's on Fire. If you haven't read this, I highly recommend it for a summer read. It inspires you, it's hilarious, and it's so well written that you just don't wanna put it down. Um, and it's all about teaching and inspiring you to be a better teacher. So check that out. But this is the game that they play in it. They play Buzz, and um, I've transferred it into Biz Buzz. So if you join me on slide seven, please type your name in any one of those open spaces. Just double click an open space and type your name. We still have room for a couple more. If you want to play, go ahead and double click into one of those boxes and type your name. All right, I removed that box that was kind of covering it up. And so the way that this is gonna work is we are going to start, start counting the numbers one through 100. But here's the catch. If your number is a multiple of two, you're not gonna say the number, you're gonna say the word biz. And if your number is a multiple of three, you're not gonna say the number, you're gonna say buzz. So I have an example. Um, on the side here, let me go ahead and paste that again. I have an example on the side of how biz buzz would sound. The first person would say one, the second person would say biz, buzz, biz, five, biz buzz, seven, biz. You'll notice that five and seven were not multiples of two or three, so we just said their regular number, and six was both a multiple of two and three, so we said biz buzz. Part of this activity is trying to pay attention to what number we're on. To make this easier, I'm broadcasting it in Collaborate. That's where you can go to turn off and on your microphone. So if you wanna look and collaborate, you'll be able to turn on your microphone when it's your turn. For the first one, we're gonna be very predictable and you can see my name is highlighted. Yes, I'm, highlighted gonna go I'm gonna go down to down Emily, to in, Emily just a minute. in just a minute. And just leave your microphone off until right before it's your turn to talk. So let's give it a try. Emily, I hope you're ready. I'm gonna start biz. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna start one. Biz. Uh, buzz. Biz. Five. Biz buzz. Seven. Seven. Buzz. MJ about today at school at class. You really picked this up. Sorry. Melissa, are you there? 
Yes, I am. I'm sorry. No I, I lost tra- I lost track of what number we're on, <laughs> admittedly. That's okay. Um, Take your time. So Wendy left off with nine, and she so said buzz. I am. Yes, yeah, so I am biz. Sharon? That's all right. We'll skip. Uh, Krista? So if I go with the number I'm on, if we're skipping Sharon, then I'm biz buzz. Awesome. So you're 12. Joanne? 13. Awesome. Sally? Biz? Chelsea. Buzz. Raha. Biz. Seventeen. Biz Buzz. Nineteen. Okay. Biz. Buzz. All right. So that's an example of how we do it in a very predicted order. Now I'm going to showcase a way we can do this in a very unpredicted order. This is going to keep everyone on their toes. And I recommend with my students um, that they actually put their finger on the hundreds chart of where we are when we're moving along so that they can follow with it. So join me on slide eight. You'll notice that, um, oh, let me go ahead and just put our names back in. I love Google Slides because we can quickly just copy and paste these in. And um, what I'm going to do is actually click on a, a name or say it out loud, and then you can go ahead and start. Our bizzes are threes and our buzzes are fours. So we'll start off. I'll go first. Teresa, one. Joanne. Haley. I totally forgot what you said. <laughs> That's all right. We're on slide eight. Our bizzes are three okay. and our buzzes are four. So Haley, you've got number two. Uh, uh, two? No, our bizzes are three and our buzzes are four. Two. Joanne. Okay, so where are we now? We're on three. I had my mic off before. Thank you. Three, biz. Remy. Buzz. Wendy. Five. Patty. I think I heard. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I need biz. Gail. Miss. Seven. Jessica. Buzz. Rachel. Is. Is. Emily. Ten. Melissa. Eleven. Sharon. Biz Buzz. Woohoo! Woo all right, so that's right, generally, so that's how, generally the how the routine is played. Routine is played. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There's a couple different ways you can do this. Um, the other one is you can actually see my mouse on Collaborate uh, as I click around to the different names. Um, and it is much harder when you don't know when you're going to be selected. Um, awesome. Who can use this in their math class and why? Go ahead and turn on your microphone and share with us. You can also chat in the uh, chat box. I could see using it in most any math class, maybe not kindergarten or first or second before they know multiples, but um, multiples and factors are something that kids need all the way up. 
Indeed. And actually in the book, um, they, he describes it as anything with a three. So kindergartners are just recognizing that numeral of three. And they would say buzz on three, uh, 13, 23, all of the 30s, and so on. Um, and so it gets really, really fun when they're learning to count up to 100. All right, folks. Um, uh Let's head on down to our Literacy Connection. Um, I'll give you all a few minutes to take a look at the Read Aloud on slide 10, and you can show me you're ready to move on by clicking slide 11. On my way to the playground, I saw three red flowers. Each red flower had six pretty petals. Each petal had two tiny black bugs. How many red flowers were there? How many pretty petals were there? How many tiny black bugs were there in all? On my way to school, I saw three little kids. Each kid rode a tricycle. Each tricycle had three wheels. How many little kids were there? How many tricycles were there? How many wheels were there in all? Hello. On my way to the zoo, I saw three waddling ducks. Each duck had four baby ducks trailing behind. Each duck said, quack, quack, quack. How many waddling ducks were there? How many baby ducks were there? How many quacks were there in all? On my way to Grandma's, I saw two fat cows. Each cow had two calves. Each calf had four skinny legs. How many fat cows were there? How many calves were there? How many legs were there in all? On my way to the circus, I saw two colorful clowns. Each clown was holding one bunch of balloons in each hand. Each bunch had five bright balloons. How many colorful col clowns were there? How many bunches of balloons were there? How many bright balloons were there in all? Alrighty, as educators, I'm pretty sure we can probably guess what the rest of the book is all about. Um, if you see connections on how you could use this book with the Biz Buzz game, go ahead and write your connections in the chat box. Awesome. All right, folks, it's time to start our big task. Um, indeed, this book is um, it's really interesting because you can take it at so many different levels. Um, it's not just about multiplication. It's all about these ideas of groupings and making uh, groups of. So I um, thought it was pretty relevant for today. <clears throat> Join me on slide 12. We're about to jump into a rich math task. And you might be asking, why do we do this? Because we'll spend 20 minutes on the task and about 20 minutes discussing the task. And it's because NCTM and their principles to action um, makes a point of saying that these are the eight math teaching practices that really work. And so today we're going to have some productive struggle. We're only going to use um, student thinking as our evidence of learning. Um, we're going to have math discourse, lots of representations and more. Before we jump in, I always ask my learners to look at the problem solving oath on slide 13. If you pledge to this oath, would you write your name in the chat box? I 
can see we have lots of great learners ready today and our task begins on slide 14. Today we're going to take this task and we're going to apply it all the way from the early primary grades through trigonometry. So get ready for some um, cross uh, grade level. It's all about cicadas, and if you happen to live where I am right now in Northern Virginia, or Virginia, North Carolina, and West Virginia, you probably know about these guys right now. Um, it says cicadas are insects that evolved and survived because they emerge in mass numbers and avoid crossbreeding. Since animals love to feast on cicadas, they don't emerge by the thousands every year. Instead, they skip years and emerge by the millions resulting in so many insects that predators become full and leave thousands alive to breed. Crossbreeding of different broods confuses cicadas periodic rhythm, causing them to reappear at unintended yearly intervals, eliminating their survival strategy of emerging in mass numbers. I've got three little cicadas on the side there. Suppose cicada brood A the blue guy, emerges every two years, and cicada brood B emerges every four years. That would mean by year four, they'd emerge together and crossbreed. Consider sets of periodic intervals such as two years and four years, and determine how often the two broods would emerge together. For example, the two years and the four years would merge together every four years. So that's your open task. There are many manipulatives on slide 15, and you can also use anything in the uh, Google Shapes apps. I'm gonna be the one in charge of the breakout rooms, so I will go ahead and make them now, and you all will get to work together on the slides below. Our breakout rooms will start in three, two, one, now. Good morning. Hi, group. You are team five, and you're going to be down on slide 20. Thank you. 20. Go ahead and add your names at the top of the slide. All right. So our job is to figure out, I'm just trying to make sure that I got it. So you're trying to figure out how how often your two and your four connect. Like we'll show up in the same way. Hi team. So brood two and brood four, they show up every four years. What other numbers would be better so that they don't show up together as often? Hi there, group two. So this brood two and brood four, man, they keep showing up together too often, every four years. I wonder what other numbers would be better so that they don't show up uh, together as often. Four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 
Well, multiples of four are four, eight, um, 16, 20, 24. So um, each of those years that um, both the cicadas emerge right here is when we'll see the cicadas mate. I think that's the goal. Hi there, group three. This is a fantastic table. Um, the only problem with two and four is those cicadas meet up way too often. What other numbers right. could you select that's going to make those meetup times happen less? So like if we did it by threes? Sure, like um, a year that a brood that comes every three years. And what's the other one? Mm -hmm. Probably any number that's kind of just divisible by two. Probably eight. Cool. Yeah. So every try eight years would be good. And, yeah. Try uh try a one where they're doing every three years and every eight years and see what what happens. How often do those guys meet? So I did one with every seven years and eleven years. And they didn't meet until I hit 77, and it's hard to show that. Mm -hmm. Because it's on the same date. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it changed the color. I can't put two colors on here. Let me see. What um, I can you can, if you make the hundreds chart bigger, um, we can draw an arrow to the 77. Okay. Hi there, group one. I see two different hundreds charts here. What numbers are you using for your two different broods of cicadas? Could you clarify the question? I thought we were just using the twos and the fours, but maybe I'm misunderstanding the problem pass. Sure, no problem. So um, the two and the four, boy, they emerge too frequently together. Every four years, they're going to meet up and crossbreed. That's like really bad for the species. So let's try some other numbers. What about every five and three years? So we have one brood coming out every five years, the other one coming out every three years. How often are they going to meet up together? And maybe try two and six. Lots of different ways you can do it, but we're trying to see um, how long we can go before they meet up together. Thank you, that's a big help. Hi there, group five. Hello. <laughs> so in our first example, the cicadas were coming out every two years and every four years. And gosh, they would just meet up together too often. Every four years they'd be together. And that's bad for their species. What other numbers might you use to see how often they meet up together? A multiple of four. So you could try four and you might even try something like six and see when one comes up every four years and another comes up every six years. When do they meet together? Four years, six years. And then try out lots of different numbers. Hi there, group four. Hello. So this is really cool. I love seeing the different representations that you have. So I can clearly see two and four on that hundreds chart. What other numbers might you work with? Um, maybe two and, oh, here's one, five and three. 
Three. So if one shows up every five years and another shows up every three years, how long till they meet? We have two copies. Hi there, group two. I see a lovely hundreds charts with fours on it. What other numbers are you exploring? I was trying three and five. Ooh, cool. And I see three and 10 on here too. The gears generator was a little challenging, um, like changing the, like I couldn't make it smaller, but with more time, I look forward to exploring with that one. Yeah, that one, it, it takes a little bit, but it ends up being super powerful if your students get used to it. Hi, group four. I like how you are resizing your Unifix cubes there. What made Thank you think you. to do that? Well, because the hundreds board is there, and I can't go all the way. You know what I'll do for you? I'll give you another slide below. Oh, God, I just saw that. I could use another slide. Yeah, there you go. Um, we'll put the hundreds Thank chart you. since that's easy to move on the slide below. Uh, and we'll okay. make it nice and big again. Would you please say it one more time? Okay, so the number line represents all the years that the A is emergent because it's every two years. So I'm going in and I'm inserting all the Bs for every four years to see when they're both emergent. But then mm -hmm. um, Teresa had said, well, what about if um, we look at when they emerge every six years? I, am I wording that correctly? Um, so I thought, we could represent it by doing, say, something like this, which I will um, make transparent, like that. Oh. You know what I'm saying? So can I just copy your your box mm -hmm. and then put it like right here? Oops. For like this so you would go to the next one where they both cross over so when is a uh... so you said only six years right yeah what was what how did you phrase that again it's it's in the multi i think what we're doing is the multiples of six where we would get the crossbreeds so eight it wouldn't work for 18 even though it's a multiple six because that's not um, it's not a multiple of the four. So I think our next oh. one is 24, 24 because all, all of the breeds would match up again on the 24. Okay. So all of them is the factors of that number is two, three, and four. So the next one will be 36.
We picked the same numbers, five and three. Yeah. <laughs> but we're showing it in different ways, which we think is interesting. And like using different manipulatives to, to express that. I, I think that's cool because I wouldn't go for the um, I wouldn't go for Unifix cube. So to see someone else use them, I thought really cool. I picked them because I'm not familiar with them. Oh. See, I think that's a good choice because then it pushes you to try it. Right. I think the one that I never use, even in my classroom, I just never use clues and air rods. And I just sometimes yeah. like, I push myself to be like, okay, what am I going to do with these things? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back to the main room, everyone. 
Can you believe you've already been working on that for 20 whole minutes? And we have some amazing representations uh, on your screen here. So as uh, you know, one of the things that I like to do is I like to select and sequence uh, purposefully for our math discussion. I'm down on slide 25. These are not my own ideas. They're adapted from Smith and Stein's five practices for orchestrating productive math discussions. Um, and the first couple that I selected are on slide 26. So let's head down to slide 26. These came from a couple different um, users. And we're going to start off in the chat box with just a notice and wonder. What do you notice about everything on slide 26 and what do you wonder? All right, we can see a lot of factors, multiples, threes, fives, and fifteens, and lots of color coding. Let's see how the different groups uh, did it. Um, whoever uh, created this pink, green, and orange uh, hundreds chart where the red arrow is, can you tell us what you were thinking and why you chose to use the hundreds chart in this way? Go ahead and turn on your mic and share with us. Sorry, I think that's mine. Um, so when I started out with that, I started with the three and five years. And I wanted to color code each of them separately. But when they overlapped, I wanted to show what they different color the overlapping of them. Um, so my threes are by purples, my fives are by green, and then my orange is where they overlap to show me um, that on the 15th would be the least common multiples. Excellent. And um, somebody else did something similar um, using these unifix cubes or the purple arrow. Can you explain to us what you're thinking with this representation with the purple arrow? So on slide 26, who did the purple arrow? And what were you thinking? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, it wasn't working a second ago. Um, so I was using Unifix cubes because I don't always use those. And so I just stacked up the fives and put the threes next to them and stacked them up until they met at 15 and then just labeled them as I would um, count by fives and count by threes. Excellent. All right, now I'm going to get you to push yourselves a little bit further. What would the unifix cubes look like if they were superimposed or put on top of the hundreds chart? Um, and how can we make connections between the purple and the red representation? Anyone can go ahead and turn on their mic. What would it look like if we pick those up, put them on the hundreds chart? And how can we connect those two? Raha, go ahead. Um, it's how you would show multiple on a hundreds chart. So if it's going by three, you want to shade um, every time you reach a multiple of three. And then when you'll meet like the 15 where it's common, maybe changing it or overlapping the two colors to show how um, that's the part where 
they meet or it's the common multiple. I think I said it okay. <laughs> Neat. So the, in the hundreds chart, we only color the last one. We don't color all of them. No, we want to color. We want to count. It's like skip counting. Um, can I use this red arrow? Yeah. It's skip counting. So if I'm skip counting by threes, it's one, two, three. And I color that three because that's my number I'm counting by. And if I'm counting by fives, I will restart or I can just count by fives. But if I'm teaching a lower grade, I would restart and say one, two, three, four, five. And I notice three and five are not the same if I'm counting by two different numbers. Uh, they don't meet. The um, pink and the green don't meet. So I, it's not a common multiple. So I have to keep going again. Neat. So in your model with the hundreds chart, we only color the last one. How is that different from the unifix cubes? I mean, we're not I see a difference here. I don't see us coloring the last of something. I see everything. So we're not coloring the last of it, but we're counting the last cube we attach. So if we're attaching three cubes, we only count the last cube. So we'll say one, two, three, and the last cube you're pointing to, three will be count. Ah, so our kind of endings uh, can be shown the same way. Um, what would we, where would we put the green like spot for this five? If we're trying to model the same five there, are we going to count the whole thing as green? Just the ending as green? What do you think? Chelsea, why do you think just the end? The way Raha explained it was that the, the way they shaded in this hundreds chart, it's just the end value, while the unifix cube shows the whole value. So that's why I think we'll go at the end to show the five and the tens. That she said, skip counting. Wonderful. And then we have um, another representation uh, here in the Cuisinaire rods. Turn on your microphone if you see a connection between the Cuisinaire rods and either the red or purple representation. What's that one more like and why? I think when I see the Cuisinaire rods, we were talking in our group of how that's a manipulative that like I personally don't feel comfortable with. I don't use it a lot. And so when I see other people use the Cuisinaire rods, it pushes me to, the, it pushes my thinking. And when I see the Cuisinaire rods, I can connect it to the hundreds chart because I can see the groupings of like how many threes are within those three groups of five. Like it allows me to see the groups within the three, the groups of three within a five that I don't, my eye doesn't always naturally see in the hundreds chart. Awesome. Who else? Chelsea said it's a combination of both. I'm really curious. How do you see the combination of both? If you look at the um, where the blue arrow it blue arrow is, it's showing you the multiples of three, but it's also like in the background can show you one, two, three, and while and then it stops, so then it starts over again. The one, two, three stops, and same with five. So it's like showing the hundreds chart, like it's shaded up here, but then it also continues on as well. Excellent. All right, so now we have this yellow arrow. And this yellow arrow, they choose to only represent some numbers. Which representation is this similar to and why? Is this more like the red, purple, or blue representation? Stephanie, go ahead. Go ahead, Stephanie. Stephanie, I think you just need to turn on your microphone. Um, okay. If you get it up, let us know what you think it is. Um, Hello? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, cool. 
I'm like, I don't, I've been having issues with my mic all week. Um, but I can kind of see, like, right away um, either the Unifix cubes or the blue arrow one. Um, but instead of in the purple arrow, it's kind of, like, reversed with the three being on the bottom versus the top. But you can also still see that representation on the hundreds chart because the specific numbers that are being highlighted, for example, in the red, like the the three six nine, the the, the brood A is being highlighted by the purple in the, the chart. So you're still only showing those those specific highlights. Neat. That makes sense. Yeah. So we have some different things that are really important to students learning this idea of multiples. And I'm going to ask you all to be active in the chat box. What is the vocabulary term that we would use um, for this little circle that I'm making um, outlined in orange? So those numbers are 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. What's the vocabulary term that we would want students to associate with that grouping of numbers? 3, 6, 9, 12, and 15. All right, and who can see those exact numbers, 3, 6, 9, 12, and 15? on one of these other models. Tell us what model you see those numbers on or which models you don't see those numbers on. Raha, go ahead. So the models, uh, I can see it in the hundreds chart. I can also see it on the number line where we're skip counting by multiples of 3, 5, and 15. The one that I don't see it on is Quisenary rods or the Unifix cubes. However, the Quisenary rods are showing multiples of 3. It's just not telling us the end value. So we're kind of adding on as we're going and helping them visually see how they connect without worrying about the total at the end of it. Great. So these different models definitely have more benefits and uh, drawbacks when they're just used in isolation. It's when we kind of force our kids to look at the way that they're similar and look at the way that they're different, that they're able to be flexible in their mathematical thinking. In the green arrow, they even managed to show three different broods on the same number line, or maybe they just chose to show us how often the, the 15 showed up, however you want to look at it. Um, and then if you join me down on slide uh, 27, slide 27, um, we'll look at the top two first. So just the, uh, the top two on slide 27, can you figure out from these two representations what the two numbers were that they used for brood A and brood B? And then turn on your mic, what's your clue? So what numbers did they use on slide 27 for brood A and brood B? Go ahead, Chelsea. Um, from what I'm seeing, they use 7 and 11, and they only intersect once, and they gave it away by using the different colors. The 7s are in orange, while the 11s are in green. Neat. So the mathematical step that you guys just took is not representing it on the uh, hundreds chart, but looking at the hundreds chart and trying to interpret it. So we're going a different step there. Um, who used the gears and um, why did you um, pick these two gears? How does this relate to the hundreds chart? Do we have someone who did the gears? Well, we're figuring out who that is. If everyone else wants to count how many teeth are on the gears, you can let us know how it relates to the hundreds chart. 
Can you hear me? Hi, Gail, we can. Hi. So I chose 7 and 11 because I didn't want to see the cicadas come out so far in my lifetime. And when I did that, I wanted to see if I could use the gears um, and figure out how to just use it because I'd never tried working with those. And I did 7 and 11 on the gears. And I sat and I watched. And as long as I watched, they hadn't, the two white dots had not come together yet side by side. Yeah, so gears give us a great representation of seeing when they actually meet up side by side. Um, all right, folks, uh, I hope from this um, math talk you were able to gather that representations can be used in different ways, um, that sometimes they show us the end of our multiples, and sometimes they just show the evenness, even spacing of multiples. Um, there's different ways of showing where the, the two multiples cross together, um, and there's different ways to interpret from that. All right, here's why you should care. One, cicadas are real. Um, they do come out every 13 or 17 years. And one of the things we could have talked about in our math talk here is the power of prime numbers. Um, since we didn't get to that, I have a great video for you all to watch um, for homework. Um, but on slide 30, I've got an example of why people care about this in other areas. Slide 30 shows two gears. And when we have composite numbers, such as gear A and gear B in figure 23, they're going to meet up frequently. Every third turn, uh, they're going to meet up in the same place. So if you're trying to distribute things like um, oil or dirt or wear and tear, you're going to have some commonalities here. Versus if you try using numbers like 9 and 31, we've got our um, numbers that are not going to mesh up together as often. Cicadas use 13 and 17, two prime numbers, and they very rarely mesh up. They're actually going to only meet once every over 200 years. So they're really working on their survival mechanism there. Um, so on slide 31 is a video about why cicadas come up that often. I even put the timestamp in the bottom for you to be interested in this. On slide 32, if you teach trigonometry, this is why you should care. Um, music has different sound waves, and when they meet up together, they are very pleasing to our ears. And that talks all about the different sine waves and how you can figure out their pitch and frequencies. Slide 33 is just in there because this is one of my favorite games when talking about multiples, primes, and composites. This is Prime Climb. Um, the link to purchase it is at the bottom. And quite frankly, my kiddos play this instead of memorizing math facts, and they learn so many um, more, and they're more flexible with their numbers. Um, the last thing I'd like to ask is on slide 36, if you all could, 36 or 37, fill in what grade do you teach and what about this lesson could you use in your grade level? Again, slide 36 and 37, what do you teach and how could you use any part of this in your grade level? Yes, someone wrote algebra. We can do systems of equations with this um, with this topic. Awesome. Well, everyone, it was a fabulous hour to spend with you all on a Saturday. Thanks for coming to Mather Days. Um, I'm going to hang out on the virtual parking lot, slide 39, for anyone who has extra questions. I encourage you to give this problem or modifications of this problem to your students. Put them up on Twitter with the hashtag MatherDays and let us connect to see the different ways that you did it. Thanks for spending Mather Days with me. Have a wonderful weekend. Someone wanted to know how do I make students anonymous? Um, and the way you do that, I'm going to share my screen so that you all can see what I'm doing.
<laughs> Wendy, I have a incredibly um, irrational fear of cicadas. So I try to make them magical for everyone else because I, I stay inside. <laughs> Um, how do I make things anonymous? I go to share. If you import your student roster or you type individual names in here, um, it will share it with the student's name. However, if you make a link available, um, you can create it with an editor, copy this link. It will allow anybody with the link to access your Google Slides and be able to write anonymously. Please uh, consider affordances and drawbacks of the anonymous link, since it could uh, pose a security risk if students share that link with strangers and then the strangers are now on your slides. Um, I am so excited to see BizBuzz in kindergarten and with PE teachers, this looks awesome. Um, where do you find these rich tasks? Um, well, I watch a lot of really boring documentaries with this mathematician um, and uh, Marcus Desoy, he's incredible, brings up a lot of questions about numbers and kind of go from there. Um, there are some places you can go for rich tasks. I know in my state, Virginia Department of Education, you can Google that in rich tasks and they're trying to make one for every grade level and every content area, um, but also Googling the term rich task and um, your math topic can help too. Uh, somebody wants to know about high school appropriate tasks. Uh, tell me what you teach. Next week we'll do a high school problem that can be modified to bring down all the way to like second grade. Um, let me know what content area. That was me. That would be cool. I, um, I've been teaching geometry, but I'm headed into algebra two and pre-calc next year. Geometry, algebra two and pre, is pre-calc trig? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And is it? So yeah, the waves and music, I've, um, I've explored that before. It's really cool. Um, cool. Yeah. And, uh, Algebra 2, do they still do conic sections or is that moved out? Um, not as much. It's a lot more of just transforming functions. Okay, I'll take a look at the standards. I haven't taught Algebra 2 in about 10 years, so the, the, the standards have changed for sure. But let me see what um, big concepts we have and how we can modify them so that our um, younger learners can access them, but our older learners can actually apply functions and some of those Algebra 2 standards. Cool, I'm gonna try that cool. for next week. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Someone wanted to know, how do you make copies of shapes and stack them together? So here, I'm going to make a game piece, this little circle. Um, actually, I'm going to do a new slide for this because I like to do control A. All right, join me on slide 42 for the game pieces or stacking pieces together. If I make a circle and let's make this one bright pink, I can hit control D a whole bunch of times. Control D is a really fast shortcut for copy and paste. Next up is Control A or Command A if you're Mac. That selects everything. You right click it, tell it to align horizontally to the left. Boom, everything goes to the left. You right click it, align vertically to the top. Boom, everything is right on top of each other. And now you have a whole stack of game pieces that you can just keep dragging off of here. Um, again, that was um, control D uh, so that you can make quick copies. Control A to select all of them. Um, align horizontally and vertically. I learned that from some other folks who have joined us for Mather Days, so keep networking, everyone. It's very helpful. Yeah, the nice thing about Control D is that it doesn't lag as much as Control C, Control V. Um, yeah, 
Absolutely. Now, if you do control A on this one, you're going to want to unclick my little uh, text box there. All right, um, when thinking about distance learning, what at what age could students successfully independently interact through this in Google Slides and a live session? Um, I've been working with kindergartners and first graders on this, um, specifically with my Girl Scout Daisies, and I've been trying to figure out what they need in order to be successful independently. Um, and part of that reason why is when I have the girls, the parents want like a minute a breathing space like parents are doing so much right now and they want the kids to work independently so we started off with just one slide as they got the hang of that as they started to learn Google we would just have a little teeny tiny tech mini lesson each time we met and I usually ask the girls if they would be the ones to um, share the mini lesson so one of them would be like how do I make a circle bring it down highlight our question with it. So I'm making the circle nice and big, and then I'm gonna make it transparent. That was one of the little lessons that um, one of the girls taught everybody else. So then they all practiced grabbing circles and making them transparent. And every week when they started doing that, they got better and better and better, um, and they're the ones leading it. All right, folks, well, happy online learning. Thanks. Yeah, Kristen.